Hey guys, so I wanted to talk about this idea for a while about what we as software developers can learn from the creation of the Marvel and DC Cinematic Universes. And with the Snyder Cut being released this week, I thought this might be a good time to do it. And I promise that by the end of this video it will all make sense, uh, hopefully. But hey, if you're new around here, my name is Rodolfo. In this channel we talk about iOS development, tech in general, productivity, and everything in between. So if that's something that you're into, consider subscribing, hitting that notification bell so you can be alerted next time I post. Tap that like button down below, it helps the channel a lot. And with all of that out of the way, let's get started. After years flirting with near bankruptcy and having to sell the movie rights to many of their most important characters, in 2008 Marvel Studios finally began to put out its own movies, starting with a very bold choice. Iron Man was a rather unknown character if you're not into comic books, but with amazing execution and Robert Downey Jr's charisma, the movie was an instant hit. But not only that, it featured a post credit scene where Samuel L. Jackson, with a few simple words, would change the superhero movie genre forever. I am Iron Man. You think you're the only superhero in the world? Mr. Stark, you become part of a bigger universe. You just don't know it yet. Who the hell are you? Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Huh. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. Here Marvel is letting you know that everything they were about to release for the next decade and more was not going to be random, but instead the product of a very deliberate, very well-crafted plan, divided in phases and that would be executed to near perfection. After Iron Man's success, The Incredible Hulk came out that same year with its own post credit scene teasing something bigger. Then, through the next few years, came Iron Man 2, Thor, Captain America, and finally, in 2012, almost half a decade ago after that Samuel L. Jackson post credit scene, the first Avengers movie came out. It wasn't quick getting here, but it was worth it. By then, you knew the characters, their personalities, the threat they were facing, everything had previously been very well established, so when you sat down to watch that movie, you could focus on the story and enjoy it. And all of that was just phase one of their plan, they were just getting started. For the next few years we saw an avalanche of scheduled releases that would always move the needle forward until we could eventually get to this. Avengers! Assemble. This was by no means rushed. It took over a decade to get to Endgame, but the reason why scenes like this, where Captain America lifts Mjolnir works so well, to the point where people cheered in the movie theater, is because it was hinted four years earlier in Age of Ultron, and you've been wondering about it ever since. The next decade shouldn't look any different, with Disney buying Fox and Marvel getting back the rights to big names like the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, along with the new sharing agreement with Sony for Spider-Man, Marvel is said to have the next six years planned out already. And then there is the DCEU. Save Martha! Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name! Yeah. A few months after Iron Man was released in 2008, DC released the first comic book movie to ever reach a billion dollars in the box office. The Dark Knight was a smashing success with critics and public alike, but after that, aside from a sequel, there was nothing really planned in the pipeline. When The Dark Knight Rises was finally released in 2012, the world had already seen Avengers, so standalone superhero movies were just not gonna cut it anymore. But instead of planning out a universe, DC tried to take a quick route. Man of Steel came first, in 2013. Then, because it wasn't really a movie meant to start a whole universe, there was just nothing for three years. Then they tried to use it as a launchpad for the DCEU by releasing Batman v Superman, a movie that just tries to introduce way too many characters, and with a plot as rushed as their release schedule, where Batman and Superman find a way to put their differences aside just because their moms had the same name. 
point. After that fiasco came Suicide Squad, a movie that is set in the DCEU but that the plot is not at all tied with the upcoming Justice League that they were building towards. Then came Wonder Woman's very good introduction movie, after she had already been introduced in Batman v Superman in a very confusing way, and then finally Justice League. A movie just completely ravaged by executives trying to influence the tone and the length of the movie in an attempt to get better by box office results than their recent fiascos. And now, four years after the theatrical release of Justice League, we're getting a do-over called the Snyder Cut. The future doesn't look any brighter either. Movies that have already been announced, like The Flash, keep being delayed, and there just doesn't seem to be a cohesive plan for the future. Okay, but what does any of this have anything to do with software development? Well. Let me know if you can spot a difference between these two stories that I'm about to tell. In the first story, stakeholders come up with features they want to see implemented, and the design team starts to work on it, creating mock-ups and sometimes even animated prototypes. Once that's all in good enough shape, user stories are created, put into a backlog, roadmaps are also created, guiding which features are going to be in each release. That backlog is then constantly refined, uh, tasks and subtasks are created and prioritized or deprioritized, and rough estimates are given. In the sprint planning, the team picks up the tasks that they are going to work on for the next two weeks and set the sprint goals. After the sprint starts, the developers start to work on the tasks based on priority. Uh, once they are done with the task, it goes to code review, then to QA testing. If it passes QA, it's done. If it fails, then the task goes back to the beginning of the development flow to fix something and then go back to code review and so on. In the last day of the sprint, there is a retrospective done to gouge what went well, what didn't, what caused blockers for the process, what needs to be improved, how can we improve that, and that entire process repeats itself until all the features for a given release are done. That release then goes to user acceptance testing, if anything needs to be fixed it follows the same process, and once everything is ready it is finally released to the public. In the second example we have a client. We promise him a full working app with absolutely everything he wants from start to finish in a few months and with limited knowledge of what the scope of the project really is. The designer then gets to work based on the descriptions of the client and creates a static mockup. The developers then start to work with about a month left to deliver the whole thing and there is no scrum. Each developer uses its own preferred app for task tracking to create tasks loosely based on the screens provided by the designer. The deadline is approaching so the client who's getting impatient asks to see a preview of whatever features are already available to see that have been built and he starts to get ideas. He starts to see that things are not quite as he thought of when he saw the static mockups. So in his mind it's two or three changes that are going to make things even better. Just change here and there and we are good to go. The project is now late because there wasn't enough time to begin with and enough information refinement to begin with and on top of that we accepted the changes that the client wanted to do. There is no automated testing, the manual testing is done by the developers themselves. After a lot of stress the app is delivered, the client is not happy because it's late, this or that was not exactly what he meant when he said this or that and it's just released to the public anyway. So which method do you think has the better chance to deliver a great product? Now don't get me wrong, the first app is not guaranteed to succeed, but I think there is a far higher chance of it becoming a better app 
from a technical point of view than the second app. And you can be absolutely sure that the second app is going to have more crashes in production. Users are going to find many more bugs that could have been avoided. The client is not gonna be happy because after using the app for a while, he's gonna start to think of all the changes that could have been done during a prototyping phase. There's going to be a lot of time and resource put into bug fixes and changing features that are already present in the app instead of updates of new features. And this second an app story isn't an exaggeration. I mean, I've seen projects where there wasn't even a designer. Uh, the developers would get the requisites and then just start building and doing the front end and the UI based on what they thought was best. And as you can probably imagine, it wasn't the prettiest website that I've ever seen. And usability was also not optimal. And there are always these excuses for not doing things the right way. People will tell you that doing planning and creating tickets and doing unit testing and all this process and meetings and stuff like that, that this takes away from time that could be spent working and delivering faster. And then there is the fan favorites. These things are just for big companies or we just don't have the budget to do all that. And that brings us to another DC Comics example, a good example of how far you can go and how much you can make do with low budget and a whole host of restrictions and still be able to execute well. And I am, of course, talking about the Arrowverse. In the early 2010s, on the heels of the success of the Dark Knight trilogy, the CW decided to make a show about the Green Arrow with the same real-world tone as Christopher Nolan's Batman. It was supposed to feature the same down-to-earth vibe and no superpowers or anything that looked out of place in the real world. The plot of the first season is just a straight-up rip-off of Batman Begins and it wasn't meant to jumpstart anything else. It was just one show. But the show did well and soon the plans changed and it's a good example of how a pivot can be done right. In the second season of Arrow, Barry Allen is introduced, only suffering the accident that would turn him into the Flash at the end of that episode. It was almost a backdoor pilot. When the third season of Arrow began, it brought with it the first season of Flash, and the two had the first very small stakes crossover. Slowly, more characters are introduced in both shows, and for the second crossover, the lineup has grown, and it serves as the backdoor pilot for Legends of Tomorrow. Meanwhile, Supergirl gets her own show on another network, and has her first crossover with The Flash, and then moves on to The CW for her second season. And even though at first big names such as Batman or Superman couldn't even be mentioned on the CW shows, the Arrowverse keeps finding ways to expand and make do with what they have, introducing characters from all corners of the DC universe, picking up characters from shows that failed in other networks like Constantine, until eventually one of the early crossovers introduces the Arrowverse to Superman, Gotham and a storyline that would reach its climax a year later. After more than seven years after the first episode of Arrow aired, against all odds, the Arrowverse gets its Avengers Endgame moment with Crisis on Infinite Earths. A story so complex and with so many characters that would be practically impossible to do any other way. Suddenly, the shows that couldn't even mention certain characters manages to have an on-screen tie-in with Smallville, the 60s and Tim Burton's 90s Batman, a live-action version of the Batman from the animated series, its own version of Superman and Bran Ralph's Superman from Superman, Man returns and even engulfs the DCU itself with an on screen cameo of Ezra Miller's Flash from the Justice League, fully suited up. Found Barry, Barry Allen. Allen. No! What does that mean? How can this. This should be impossible now. It should be impossible now? Now, don't get me wrong, the Arrowverse shows are far from perfect, but my point here is that even with low budget, restrictions on which characters they could use, 22 episode seasons that drag storylines forever, a flash that can't stop crying. It's okay. I don't know how much longer I can hold out. And we love you, mom. 
The Arrowverse managed to create a better, more concise DC universe than the movies which had high budgets, had no restrictions on characters, and could even get the best actors and directors that they could get their hands on and so on. So the lesson here is that planning is never a waste of time. Iron Man was released in 2008 and The Avengers in 2012, Man of Steel in 2013 and Justice League in 2017. So in both cases, they each took four years from getting to the first movie in that universe to the team-up movie. The DCU shortcut ended up taking exactly the same time as the planned release schedule of the Marvel Universe. But while one had a constant stream of movies coming out during those four years and were building something, the other spent three years without releasing a single movie and then tried to cram everything in two years and get everything done last minute. And I think that translates perfectly to software development. Spring plannings and refinement meetings and retrospectives, it all may seem like a waste of time that's taking time away from being able to do more stuff, but it's not. It's time that will be well spent making sure that you're building a quality product with confidence that you have a process to lean on instead of time spent stressing out about the many avoidable issues that don't stop showing up and overworking yourself trying to fix them. So what are your stories of good and bad experiences with project management in the projects you've worked on? Let me know in the comments. And I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Helps the channel a lot. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to get the next ones. And I'll see you on the next video. Bye.